afternoon, good evening, good morning, Danvers. Uh, my name is Mark Zuberek, and welcome to the Topics of the Town News. And I have two very special guests today, and I'm going to continue this because our elections, state elections, are coming due. So today, I have been toying with the idea of doing a um, Jonathan uh, Ring uh, for, um, what do you call it? What, what are you running for? I am running for Register of Deeds of Essex County Southern District. There you go. See, now my memory banks are coming back. My second guest is uh, Damien Ancatel, and he Danvers. is running for? State Senate, Second Essex, Peabody, Beverly, Danvers, and Salem. Welcome, both of you. And just for your information, the agenda and opinions are solely by the topics of the town host, their guests, contributors, and commentators. And this is a commentator-type show that we put in our input into what's going on in the town of Danvers. I will continue a very um, uh, quote that I've been using over the last uh, four shows. And just think of what I'm saying. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. So if you don't understand what you're thinking, and you respect the person that's telling you this story does not necessarily mean it's true. It may be false, but you have to determine for yourself what the truth is. So, just to catch up on some of the small town issues like we have in, in our little town of Danvers, our big town of Danvers, Town elected government officials believe that their purpose is to deliver more funding to our small town government, and it will grow and spend more on itself. Now, this applies to Danvers currently, what I'm trying to say, but it also applies to the state level. The general voters and taxpayers are tired of government creep. More taxes do not mean better government. The state of Massachusetts and the town government is deaf to the issues that count. And we're hoping for both of you to carry some of this message and hopefully you'll get to that uh, opportunity. We are over-regulated over-legislated and overtaxed and abused as ratepayers and taxpayers in the delivery of basic services we need relief. And uh, Ben, if you can put up my infamous slide, this is, now don't tell me, <laughs> I missed the good old days. Remember when you could actually have an opinion without offending somebody. And this leads me to my DEI comments at the end of the show, and we'll get to that in a moment. So the news brief in Danvers itself is basically that the Town Charter Review debate is beginning and I will be presenting the first uh, town charter review meeting that's been held at the selectmen's room and that will probably be either one or two hours of the meeting and how it's being coagulated. Do we want to remain a, a lonely town or become a city with all the financial benefits and duties imposed by the state legislature? Cities have benefits that will address the term limits of our selected officials. 
cities elect their mayors every two years. They can fire them as well by casting a vote. School committees will attain the appropriate attention from the taxpayers and the authority of the elected positions. No free ride for any pet project or organization. Now, at this moment, I'm proud to introduce my two guests again. Uh, we have Damien Ancatel, Republican candidate for the state Senate. Yep. And he is, uh, you don't have any uh, primary uh, contested. I have no primary. I am uh, straight through to the general. Obviously, I am on the primary ballot. So I hope that you can cast the vote for me. I at least consider me. Anyways. It's a vote to reintroduce you back into the fold. It is. And to my left, I have the candidate for the Register of Deeds, Jonathan Ring. And he is a candidate for the uh, Register of Deeds for the state, Essex Southern District. Yes, Essex Southern District. It's about 30 towns in the district. Uh, so so I'm, all these towns. I'm just throwing up a coin in my mind, and I am going to ask Mr. Ring to make an introduction, and we'll put up his uh, sign onto the screen while he's presenting his position. Why are you running and what does a register of deeds do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Ring for Register of Deeds. Uh, I'm running because I want to provide the best customer service uh, and, and the protection for your most valuable asset, uh, which is your home, as represented by uh, your deed. A registry of deeds uh, for this district, or, there are about 21 registries of deeds in Massachusetts, uh, divided up by uh, several uh, districts uh, within counties, and they're the recording office uh, for all uh, for all transactions related to your uh, real estate. So your deed is recorded at a registry of deeds office, and why this is so important is because it represents your uh, your title and your rights uh, to your home ownership. That uh, so having the best customer service, having the best recording service, making sure that your deeds are maintained, and uh, making sure that uh, your recording is accurate is absolutely important to safeguarding your rights as a property owner. So your function for the registry of deeds is to supervise the organization that's already in place. Correct. Do you set any policies or any guidelines for the registry, or has that been established in law? Uh, many policies have been established in law, but there are uh, there is room for additional policies um, that the register can uh, implement. Um, for example, one of the policies that the Registry of Deeds currently promotes and that I want to expand upon is the Property Fraud Watch Program. Um, that, that is, you can sign up to the Property Fraud Watch Program to make sure, to make sure that if, any, uh, if there's any um, recording of your deeds uh, by any, or by any fraudulent activity against your deeds, you'll re receive first notice. A lot of people don't know that this pro that this program exists. Um, what I would like to do is for the Registry of Deeds to work with cities and towns uh, uh, assessors to promote it to as many residents as possible, so that we could get many people, more people, to sign up to this program. And why that's so important is because if you if you take out or if you have any change of uh, if you have any change if you have a quick claim deed. Um, uh, uh, recorded where you've added people to your property. Of course, if you've done it and you receive notice that you've done it, you're 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 good. But if somebody tries to fraudulently uh, take your identity and sign out uh, property in your name, you'll also receive that notice, and then you can take steps to stop it by alerting the Registry of Deeds that somebody is making a fraudulent document 
registry can then contact the district attorney's office uh, and take steps uh, uh, to um, undo the fraudulent document that's being recorded against you. <coughs> uh, but it all starts with your knowledge. If you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't know somebody is doing that, um, then they can take several steps before you start getting uh, notices of, um, of loans that, that you owe that you never took out um, or eviction notices and, and so forth and so on. So the first thing is to, is to get information and to maintain, uh, your, uh, maintain notice of your identity. Of your identity. Right. Correct. Now, the question always comes up, and I hear this all the time, is there are significant fees to register your properties or your deeds with the register of, of deeds. Now, those fees have been rising mm -hmm. every year, and there are <clears throat> avenues for accessing, accept, accepting or accessing those fees. And one of the uh, positions that I have been told about is that it's for the CPA, uh, which is another tax distribution <laughs> mechanism for the state uh, register of deeds. Mm -hmm. And what is your position in regard to that? Because not all of them participate and not all of the towns and cities participate. So how much money are we paying for each and every transaction? And then where does that money go? Right. Um, like a $75 fee about, um, I believe about uh, 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 $30 of that uh, goes to the CPA fund. Right. I mean, I mean, essentially, the this particular registry of deeds collects over about $34 million worth of fees and taxes. Because, Total. Um, uh, and, it, and it goes to the state general fund. And of course, they have to distribute that. Um, and, the, and, the, and these funds are set by law. Um, so you're right. Um, see, they go to, you know, many of these funds are distributed to the, to the CPA um, and they're distributed to, uh, to town and city CPAs. Uh, they're supposed to be matching funds, you know, for, for CPAs um, to, to the cities and towns. What the Register of Deeds can do is at least make sure that um, the proper amount of funding is going to each of the cities and towns. And delegated from <clears throat> the receipts that you obtain of mm -hmm. the $34 million. Yes. And uh, so in order to do that, the re registrar does work under the um, auspices of the Secretary of State's office. So, um, you know, we do have to work with the Secretary of State. We do. It would be good also to involve the auditor. Um, the state auditor to make right. sure that um, these programs are being funded adequately. See, this this goes back to my original statement that I made in the beginning of the show. The state of Massachusetts and town government is deaf to the issues that count. We are over-regulated, over-legislated, over-taxed, and abused as ratepayers in the delivery of basic services, mm -hmm. we need relief. The, the register of deeds fees are basically a redistribution of taxes. Mm -hmm. And the thing <coughs> is that it is so convoluted mm -hmm. in the way it's distributed back out and Who's doing the redistribution? Mm -hmm. The bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the legislators don't even know what's going on. So now, the, the, the thing that I would like to do is, is this goes back to this statement that I've been using for months. Yeah. And the thing is that the communities are being hurt <coughs> by Excuse this me. legislative redistribution of our tax payments that we actually make. And th these fees are mandatory. Yep. They're not uh, optional. 
And uh, the thing is that with the fees that are being charged, how much of that is distributed for maintenance and operations of the register of deeds uh, operation? Let's say it goes in, into in your, the general fund. It goes well, up. right. Yeah, but who, who, how much of a cost is this to the state? Oh, right, so. right. Um, I guess I can only answer that indirectly. Uh, the registry of deeds is the, the budget is about for the Essex Southern District is about three million dollars. Three. Okay. Uh, so that's what's allocated to operate uh, the registry. So it does. So in terms of fees and taxes together. It obviously, as a collection agency, on behalf of the state, collects way more than that. Right. Um, and so, uh, so the registry itself, you know, probably gets enough to operate. Um, that that, but that's the cost of doing business. Correct. Yeah. And that three million dollars is reflected in thirty-four million dollars of receipts. Yes. In fees and distributions by mm -hmm. the bureaucracy in the state uh, administration. Correct. So why are you running for this position? Well, my, my primary purpose is in, is in maintaining the registry, providing customer service, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, for registry users, for taxpayers, <coughs> uh, making sure that uh, the programs that we have in place are benefiting uh, the people that the registry is supposed to serve uh, and making sure that uh, we can help homeowners understand their rights as homeowners as well. Um, so it's really uh, taking my experience both as uh, in, in, in retail management and customer service as well as municipal management with the Rockport Housing Authority, which, by the way, was also a $3 million budget. Yeah. Um, and combining all those experiences and implementing them, uh, you know, uh, for the registry. Also, it's important to make sure that, un unfortunately, this is a political campaign in which you're electing. I say that because we want this to be non... You're running as partisan candidates, Republican versus Democrat. Um but you essentially want the registry to be nonpartisan. Right. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, positions like this become too politicized. Um, one of my prospective opponents, you know, has a lot of uh, support from unions and has a lot of su and support from political <clears throat> activists. And unions play a, a huge role in negotiating contracts uh, on behalf of the employees that are that are uh, employed by the registry. So you wanna have somebody that's not entangled in those union um, uh, negotiations in order to be able to employ the best people and not employ people based on politics. Right, and that's not <coughs> what you know, it's who you know. Right. The uh, final question, and, and you brought this up already, is the fraud that happens in regards to the deeds Mm -hmm. that are be basically stolen or mm -hmm. fraudulently uh, you know, uh, sold, selling the property for mortgage money. And how can we, there's, there's a lot of advertising that goes on in regards to stopping this. Right. And it's private industry that's coming in mm -hmm. to <laughs> somehow stop it. I don't understand how they can stop it. Right. But the thing is, how does the registry, registrar, make sure that these fraudulent transactions do not take place? Right. Because you are the final authority about checking the signatures and the author authorization to do any of the uh, transactions. Correct. I mean, there are... There are limitations to what the registry can do. Um, as, you know, as many of those commercials say, and it's true, and I'm also a notary, um, if, all the, if all the paperwork is properly notarized and everything is properly done on paper and, and handed in, and it looks, you know, because the, there are many deeds that pass through the registry, you can't check them all, but that's the importance of the alert system 
um, because you want to make sure that the customers are alerted about uh, documents that are being uh, signed in their name. If they signed it themselves, no problem. But if they don't recognize something that's going on, then they need to alert the registry as soon as possible. You know, with title <coughs> fraud, there could be up to, you know, FBI statistics have up uh, as of 2022, and they're probably updating these statistics now, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a upwards of $350 million worth of title fraud uh, yes. across the United States. Um, that sounds low to me. Yeah, it's, I would have thought yeah. it would have been a lot more. Yes. Well, <laughs> it, there probably is. That's just all they know about. Um, and um, the, the, the key thing here is you're running for this office mm -hmm. as a watchdog yes. and um, you're trying to prevent some of this yes. to happen to our residents. And actually, I do take inspiration from the former Register of Deeds, John O'Brien, and he's a Democrat. And six years ago, I did run against him for other reasons. And even though we had, uh, even though we had some heated debates, uh, during those debates, I actually got to know him a little bit. Um, and as, aside from what we disagreed about back then, one of the things that I do agree with him about and that he really championed was uh, the Fraud Watch Program, uh, the Homestead Protection Act, um, securing people's titles, alerting people about fraudulent activity. Um, and he really was serious about, like, uh, you know, protecting people's home ownership rights, you know, it, you know, and he's a, and he was a Democrat. Um, so, so those issues are nonpartisan. And so it's what he did. I want to expand upon it. I want to build upon John O'Brien's legacy, um, in, a, in, in expanding, um, the services that the registry of deeds can do to alert homeowners and, the, and be a watchdog on these fraudulent and activities. And the customer is the ultimate Absolutely. person that you're serving. It's the taxpayer. Absolutely. The ta the that's right. The, the, the yeah. taxpayer and the fee payer. Yeah. Well, because the taxpayer, if you own in a house, you're paying taxes on it. it. That's correct. Right. Unless you're a college, then you don't have to pay taxes on it. Well, you well. can live in the in the uh, basement <laughs> apartments, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. Jonathan, I uh, wish you luck, and, and uh, I hope you come back later on. You don't have any uh, contested uh, primary, do I'm, you? I have no primary opponents, which I'm very grateful for. The primary is September 3rd, and I encourage you to vote in the Republican primary right. or the Democrat primary, whatever you want to do. Um, but, I, but I'm but i going to be on the November 5th. Uh, I advance from the primary, to the, like Damien, to the November 5th um, ballot general election. Right. Uh, encourage every single vote you can. If you want to learn more about me, definitely go to my website uh, at www.jonathanring.org. Um, I even have uh, new parts of my website that give you registry information as well as my platform. Um, and just remember the name, Jonathan Ring, uh, for Register of Deeds. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And just for everybody's uh, edification, I messed up yet last night because I went to no. jonathanring.org as an email address. Ah. And that is totally out of the question. And I just got messages back that not received. <laughs> it could so, happen to the best of us. Ring is around, and I've seen a lot of your signs in the area. So welcome aboard, and I uh, hope you can solve the issues for the residents of Danvers, Peabody. And, oh, you have uh, 16 towns. I have 30. 30 towns 30 in towns. Essex <laughs> County. Yeah. Uh, it's a large district. And so um, just think of it as every single town except for Andover, North Andover, Methuen, and Lawrence. That's Essex Northern District. So I have all the other Essex County towns. Well. I also have on my <clears throat> website, jonathanring.org, I also list all of the towns that are part of the district so that you can uh, see if you're within my district. Great. The reason I asked you that question is because I've received a lot of information in regards to uh, voter registration, 
uh, <coughs> voting for the primaries, mm -hmm. uh, voting for the national election or presidential election and state elections. And what I'd like to do is share just a few dates because these are important. Statewide primaries are going to be held on September 3rd. Presidential election and state election, basically, uh, is going to be held on November 5th. And I know that we're going through a lot of discussions and contentious uh, decisions in regard to the national elections, but our state elections and the city elections, not the towns, but the cities, <coughs> do present a case for being concerned about what's going on. And that's why I'm having both of you here, and I hope to have uh, uh, Joan Lovely, and uh, I don't know who's your Democrat uh, registrar. Duff. Yep, um, I've, there are two candidates for Register of Deeds on the Democratic side, uh, Joseph Gentleman and um, Eileen Duff. Um, so, and they and whoever wins that primary is who I face right. in the November election. And that's uh, that's why I'm waiting for that uh, <coughs> that side of it until after the primary. So we'll hold a similar meeting with the Democrat side because I want to give them equal time. Absolutely, oh, sure. I have been told that I I try not to, but I do. <laughs> uh, voter registration deadline postmarked by Saturday, August 24th. Yep. In-person request by Saturday, August 24th. And online, Saturday, August 24th. Early voting available from Saturday, August 24th to Friday, August 30th. Absentee ballot request deadline. <laughs> and this is that little package that we received from the state uh, Who's, who's that? Uh, Galvin. Galvin, yeah. Uh, and I'm saving that because <laughs> I don't want that to be a hazard for me voting because I'll bring that with me because I don't like mail-in voting. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be there in person because that's when you actually meet the candidates and you meet your neighbors and yeah. you have a social event as yep. well. Absolutely. Uh, yours is probably more complicated because you've got so many communities, but we're sort of in Danvers. That's how it's done. Mm. Absentee ballot request <laughs> deadline is uh, Monday, August 26th. Absentee ballot return deadline is September 3rd. Voter registration deadline for the November 5th uh, elections are September 26th, and early voting is available from Saturday, <coughs> October 19th to Friday, November 1st. Absentee ballot request deadline is to be received a blank ballot by mail by Tuesday, October 29th. That seems early, but... Early voting. Early voting, no. that's what, what happens. Early vote often, as they... Absentee ballot return Great. deadline <laughs> is postmarked by or before election day and received by Friday, November 8th. That's three days after the elections uh, take place. So, early voting, I don't like it, but that's how it is. We need our legislators to change that back to what it was. So now what we would like to turn to, and I'm going to devote this hour to you two, okay. because I gave uh, Jonathan a whole half an hour, and uh, I'm going to give the same to you, uh, Damien. Damien Ancatel is running for State Senate, 2nd Essex District, and this is the 2024 campaign. Correct. Welcome on board. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. I appreciate it. I appreciate Danvers listening to me. Um, I do appreciate the uh, casual attire. Usually you have me gussied up and uh, all my fancy duds. <laughs> I'm going so, fishing. 
<laughs> so uh, I, I appreciate that. Um, my name is Damian Agatel, and I um, am a lifelong North Shore resident, born and raised in Salem. I live in Peabody for the last 22 years with my wife, Lori. Uh, she's a nurse over at Salem Hospital. I was a correctional officer. I worked at the Attorney General's office in an internship to get the Internet Crimes Against uh, Children's Division um, going. I, um, um, I was a probation parole officer for a little bit, a little stint down in South Carolina. Um, I've owned my own businesses. So um, a couple of the issues that are really concerned me on running this year, um, most significantly is the onslaught and the uh, influx of illegal immigration into our community. I feel that this is the number one most important issue on the ballot this year. And the reasons is because it, um, it touches every aspect of our lives supply lines, food costs, housing costs, housing availabilities for our seniors and our veterans, um, education to our children, the number of uh, children going into our schools are gonna create an overflow uh, and overcrowding of our schools. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are kicking today. I apologize for that. Um, and the second thing is the large cost of living. Um, you may or may not know, just recently Forbes advisory news came out and Massachusetts is actually now the second um, highest fill. cost of living in, the, in our country. So to live in Massachusetts, you're living in the number two state in the cost of living. What I'd like to do today is to explain on how my opponent, Joan Lovely, Senator Joan Lovely, has... Um, voted for legislation and pushed laws and initiatives that actually drove up the cost of living in our communities and also uh, created a magnet for illegal immigration to come into our community and cause the problems that they do. Uh, this isn't about bashing Joan, it's just about to bring um, uh, awareness of her record and how her voting record actually um, created these issues that I, I have concerns over. And I would like to present, if I can, if I have time, uh, the solutions, because there are solutions to all of these problems and we can reverse them and create a better uh, community for everybody. Um, so as for- You're uh, welcome to right. spend the half hour. I have right. no place to go. All right. <laughs> so first of all, we all know that we have an influx of illegal immigrants. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right now, we have over a million illegal immigrants. And that's an old number. That's back in April. But there actually is a belief that there's closer to 1.2 right now. Um, what this does and why they well, first of all, why they're here. They're here because we have what I like to call is a magnet, a welfare magnet. So they come into our state. They get money from our state. They get housing from our state. They get um, food delivered to their um the all the uh, hotels and motels that they are taking up in uh, Route 1, 128. You'll see people crossing 128 now. We never, uh, Route 1, we never had that before. That's now illegal. we have people running across the highway left and right. Um, they, uh, they drive up uh, housing costs because when there is a, a hotel or uh, an apartment available or a senior living available, they get prioritized over our senior citizens over our homeless veterans, um, they get a priority uh, notification on their name so that they get pulled out of the hotels and brought into housing. Also with Section 8 housing and low income housing, they also get those prioritized over our residents and our seniors and our just our uh, legal residents of the community. And uh, so we need to, so that's part of the magnet. The other magnet is, is that they get a, a stipend um, $2,500 a month from the federal government, another $1,200 from our, our state. They actually get more money in their pocket, cash in their pocket, than our, um, our seniors do from their Social Security. And people who put the money in for their whole entire life, they might be lucky to get $1,000, $1,200, $1,400 a month. These people are pulling in $3,000 plus a month and stipends from our, our, um, our, uh, benefit packages that we have available. Also, our health care, 
is strained to the limits due to the illegal immigrants uh, taking, uh, going into um, emergency rooms, doctor visits. These people get free care and they go up to the hospital for a toothache. Uh, ambulances got to go up to um, uh, these hotels and motels in the middle of the night. 30% of all, nine, well, it's more than that now, but the last time uh, back in February, there was a, a report saying 30% of all 911 calls go out to illegal immigration issues, um, sometimes at two, three o'clock in the morning. And it's just to bring them to the hospital because they have a toothache or an earache. It's minor things, but sometimes it is major things. Damien, if, if I may, mm -hmm. let me, uh, you know, this is, this is an issue that's been brewing in our state for many years. The reason is that the legislature itself and now through the governor the governor that we have mm -hmm. have made this possible and the thing is what is Damien Ancatel going to do in the state senate to rectify this situation that's the key okay so well for just so so you know uh right now we're spending about 400 well they're reporting about $450 million a month that we're spending on illegal immigrants. My plan is firm and it's fair. I say this, defund, detain, deport. We're going to defund. We're going to say no more housing stipends, no more um, uh, food deliveries to their, pro, uh, to their homes or to, to the, where they're staying up at these hotels. Um, we're going to put into place, and actually there are already laws in place, but we just need to enforce them. Anybody that um, hires an illegal immigrant, anybody that um, houses illegal immigrants will be fined and utilize uh, some type of uh, uh, punitive measure to stop them from doing that. I would suggest defunding them. Anybody as a, for detaining them, anybody that is arrested as an illegal immigrant must be detained. There has to be a law in the book that it's mandatory detention until that they can get through court and then get taken out by ICE. And then as they're going through it, if they are found guilty of a crime, we need to do an enhance um, criminal penalties similar to what we have in hate law crime statutes. We need to enhance that and to deport. Once they get out of prison, if they get in trouble for prison, they have to go. If they get in any situation where they get involvement with the government, we need to deport them. Just work on the deportation. The only, mo the only money that I would actually suggest supporting spending on illegal immigrants is to offer them a one-way ticket back to the country for them and their family so that they can go back home to where they came from. And that's what I believe. And my opponent has um, recently um, supported, uh, not even supported, voted on and passed legislation that removed money from um, from local subsidies that they would give out to uh, Peabody, Beverly, Davis, Salem, all other cities and towns. They removed that money, about $350 million, and shoved it off into the uh, illegal immigration situation. So they moved money like that left and right. They also added another uh, $250 million onto the budget so they moved about five hundred and uh, five six hundred million dollars from out of uh, monies that were going to state and local area uh, state and uh, cities and towns Municipal local towns. cities and mu municipalities and moved them to work on paying for legal immigration issues. The the thing the thing is, this illegal immigration is bigger than even the state administration of it. It's more federal plus state. Federal is allowing this to happen and the state is permitting it to happen because they fund the situation. The funding, uh, I remember looking at the, uh, and you know that I'm, I'm a numbers guy. I mm -hmm. like budgets. Yep. Budget back in 95, uh, even at that time, 97, 98, 
was for the state was less than ten billion dollars. The budget now is over fifty three or fifty four yeah. billion dollars. They just passed. They just. Um, they just uh, supplemental so, budgets yeah, they again. They started working on uh, fifty three million uh, billion dollars. Yes. So the thing is, is it's not the federal government that's causing this to happen. It's the state legislature that has let it proceed in this fashion mm -hmm. because there's no controls on the governor or on the funding that's being uh, spent on this. Yeah. When are we going to get relief to our taxpayers? And here we go again. November 3rd is when the you're going to get relief. You the state of Massachusetts and town government is deaf to the okay. issues that count. We are over-regulated, <coughs> over-legislated, over-taxed, and abused as ratepayers in the delivery of basic services. And we are overtaxed for many, many reasons. Well, so what, <coughs> else, what else do you yeah. think is, is important right now on well, the legislative side? So with the illegal immigration thing, with the taking in the money, as you just mentioned, it has a double-edged sword. So taking in a, a large amount of money from uh, the federal government does two things. Um, it increases um, inflation. So we have to take in money to pay directly to these illegal immigrants to pay for money. But my opponent, she went out, um, so a few, two years ago, there was this offer for a large amount of money, a couple hundred million dollars, $450 um, million. Our economists in, that work for the state warned the legislature, and there's a report out there that you can read, and it warned the legislature, said, if you take this money, you are gonna have inflation rates through the roof, interest rates uh, through the roof, so that people won't be able to buy houses, so that the values of properties will be going up through the roof, so the value of all goods will go through the roof, all services will go through the roof. And they warned and said, listen, this is gonna be generational. If you do this, this is gonna harm the middle um, income people. It's gonna make you, force you to increase taxes. And they accepted the grant, right? They, it wasn't even a grant, it was just giving Federal them funds. It was just money that they just took. And they knew the dangers of it, and they still took it, and they spent it. And it was last year that they took it. So they still took the money, despite the fact that they were warned that it would cause tremendous generational um, um, uh, affordability issues. So our food prices go up. Our um, cost of ho housing goes up. Our rents go up. All of these things go up, 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 up. Okay, so now that we have this inflation, and if you notice on the budget, I mean, 13, 10, 10 billion to 53 billion in mm -hmm. 20 years is ridiculous, but uh, we've allowed it to happen. How do we control it? So, and the thing is that our residents, at least this resident, <laughs> doesn't know what kind of controls you can do because everybody seems to go with the flow. Well, right now, uh, well, there's also other compounding issues that compound on it. So the uh, passing of the green initiative uh, plan that they did back in 22, um, that that also um, piggybacked on top of, you know, also they, the economist actually talked about that as well. They said, listen, this is gonna cause a 30 to 50% increase in house values. I mean, not house values, house costs to right. do work on the properties and they still passed it anyways despite the fact that they knew that they were going to drive houses to be unaffordable so the green initiative and on top of that within a month later they got this other report that said that you can't take this money in because you're going to have inflation increases foods and goods and services inflations housing inflations on top of housing inflation so they still took the money they did it Number one thing that we need to do is drop the green initiative. Get rid of any green programs, green initiatives that um, that you think that is uh, helping us. It is not. If you look down in Nantucket, they had um, 
I dad a windmill running, not even a year old. Thing fell apart, put green foam into the ocean, plastic, fiberglass, creates a, a horrible uh, environmental uh, uh, crisis that shut down all the beaches uh, down in uh, Nantucket. But the fact of the matter is we need to step back from our regulation so people can come in, build less affordable housing so that they can buy, build houses so they can buy houses so they can sell houses cheaper. So it, it's a cycle. So that's number one. We need to cut down regulations on building codes, so on. We also need to start cutting regulations on our businesses. COVID had a major impact on our businesses, but regulations had an equally um, devastating um, effect on our businesses. Right now, in order, I mean, you can't even braid someone's hair, not that I need it, it's not an issue with me, but you can't even braid someone's hair without having a license to braid hair uh, as a business. To me, that you need a license to braid hair. I mean, I know it's a skill set, I know it's a thing, but it's crazy to me that they, and this is new, this is like three years old that they started this. So they over-regulate things, over-professionalize things, over-license things. You need to stop pulling some of those things back. And if they are, you need to cut back the cost on them, make them faster to be able to get, streamline them a little bit, streamline business creation, uh, streamline the abilities for uh, people to be able to get banks, uh, bank loans, so that they can get out there and, and, and get the capital that they need in order so that they can create and drive our economy. Small business growth in this community would be the most vital thing to the, the prosperity of all the community. We need to, to streamline that and cut back the regulations. In order to start a construction company business, you have a, a, a book that big, and it's not even a joke. You got seven different books, and two of them tell you the complete opposite. Oh, do this, no, you can't do that, you gotta do this. So we gotta cut back our regulations a, a lot cut back our green energy initiative um, spending, and we also need to stop our spending on illegal immigrants. Well, first and foremost, we have to re realize that our expectations of these initiatives are only as good as the background of how it was researched. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very quick example of the licensing that has been happening in our existence with the state. I have a construction license. Construction license is a two-year uh, permit or license. Yeah. All that comes down to is a hundred bucks every two years. It becomes all this licensure and this regulation becomes a collection agency for fees and processing uh, state uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. And what it does again, going back to our original statement, redistribution of our collection of fees. So it's all about money. Yep. And it doesn't matter what happens as unintended consequences to these regulations because most of these regulations expire in a few years anyway. Well, another thing that you're talking about, you're talking about taxes. So we just had, we just passed a uh, millionaire's tax. They're calling it the millionaire's tax. Anybody that makes over yeah. a million dollars, they're gonna increase it. Well, what happened with that was a good portion about 45% of our millionaires left the state. And when they left the state, they took their capital with them. They took their businesses, all the money that they bring into the state. And what happened with that, the next month, we actually had shortfalls in our, um, in the, I, I hate to call them revenues because they're tax dollars. They're not revenues. It's not like I gave you something for it. <clears throat> their tax dollars got they were uh, deficiencies, so they, they were underwhelming. And they are at a shortfall for about, um, I believe it's $250 um, million a month. They're, they're down that much from year over year. 
So it's like 250, or it might be 350 if my memory, it's one of those two. But it's like a 250 to $350 million shortfall. But it directly correlated with the increase of taxes and people leaving the state. They tax it the next month, shortfalls, shortfalls, shortfalls. Now, back in April was the only month that we actually ran um, even with it. But that's over the last nine months, uh, 12 months now that we actually had those shortfalls. So we have a deficiency in expected tax revenues coming in about 350. We have a million illegal immigrants that we're paying for from the second they wake up to the second they wake up the next day, 24 seven, we're paying for them. The tax pays are. But you see the, the reasoning behind this is that we have so many millionaires that are going to supplement the tax revenue that we're going to receive. But nobody ever thinks of unintended consequences of what this action will have. And they also do not care to reverse that tax if it becomes too cumbersome and it reduces the tax revenue. There's no intent ever to change or reduce any tax that has been imposed because they like it that way. Now, that becomes an opportunity for our legislators to act upon things like this instead of acting about gender gen, uh, gender uh, transformations and sex education in the schools. And um, uh, what, what are, they just uh, passed a um, uh, MCAS, eliminate yeah. MCAS. Yeah. What the heck does the legislature have to do with it? This is a local education program. But I still stand by my statement originally that our school systems in this town of Danvers, let's say, because that's who we're talking about, is not a Danvers school system. It's a state school system. And the state runs it. So I don't know why we even have the school committee. And the legislature is allowing this to happen because they want to imprint their thumb on everything that's going on. Look at look at what happened in Danvers with in regard to this trash collection fee, two hundred bucks. bucks yeah. That's because the legislature <laughs> itself passed regulations. It's not even a law; it's a regulation that allowed the cities, the cities primarily, to override the two and a half. We're waiting to see what's going to happen now. They're actually, because they they have so many shortfalls, they're actually uh, proposing that cities and towns will have the right to add an additional tax onto the cities and states, uh, almost like an income tax to the residents. They do that in New York City already. Yeah, yeah. And in California. Which is cheaper to live in than actually Massachusetts. Right. Now, believe it or not, California is the only one. <coughs> we're, we're more expensive than New York. Unbelievable. Well, I can't well, believe it. Damien, the, the key to this whole um, campaign that you're running right now is to reverse some of this action that has taken place over the last probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, your emphasis on illegal immigration, on housing, on housing production. Listen to this. What the heck does the state have to do with housing production? It's a local issue. It's zoning. And now they're imposing your, our legislature. The MBTA law. MBTA law. Yeah. Why? <clears throat> because they can't convince the towns to build anymore because they don't want to. So they got to bribe them for the $150,000. They bribe them. They threaten them. And threaten. Well, they bribed them first and then they threatened them after. But, but so, I do I do want to do one thing. I, one one proposal that I would. You got five I'd, minutes. I'd like to knock out um, the millionaire's tax. I mean, I know that it's got to go through some steps. 
but I'd like to get rid of that. And I'd also like to drop the income tax down to like 4% and have it sunset. You know, have a four year, a five year option on it. And if it's something that works out, if we generate more revenue, uh, more revenues, more tax dollars from that, um, we'll be able to eliminate that. Uh, it, we'll be able to revisit that and say, okay, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. But I think dropping taxes will generate more um, um, tax dollars into the state coffers. And I, I think that that's a, a, a benefit and we'll be able to do a lot with it. And I think that we should just start focusing on infrastructure and, and stay away from social engineering issues and just completely infrastructure, make the community safe, make sure our police and fire have the money and the tools necessary to do the job, make sure our roads aren't collapsing, you know, our bridges aren't collapsing underneath us and that we can drive down the street without losing our, blowing out our tires all over the place. And we should be using some of the uh, registrar's uh, yeah. uh, money that's been collected and uh, redistributed for yeah. other purposes yeah. than infrastructure. Yeah. Absolutely, I mean, one of the, I mean, the, the tax dollars that are generated from the sale of a home, uh, just that alone should go back into the community for that home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And because they have been collecting taxes, overtaxing <laughs> us even locally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop at the state level. It goes down to the local you know, uh, municipalities that are collecting all these taxes and we are so proud of the fact that we have almost a hundred percent collection rate mm -hmm. for real estate taxes because people feel responsible for maintaining our environment yep. that we live in yep. however we are being abused so we're reaching out to you and you as candidates for state office, mm. that will help us. Yep. So in closing, what have you got to say? W dot Damien, Damien, spelt that way with an A, not an E, dot com. So it's votedamien.com. If you need to get in touch with me, it is info at votedamien.com. And I appreciate it, Danvis. Mr. Ring. Yes. Would you give us a closing comments and why should we vote for you? And you're going to get the same. Absolutely. You know, I was just thinking about, you know, his, uh, the compounding problems you mentioned with immigration and the, and, and the same can be said with um, the fact that the crime rate of immigration also increases the potential of other fraudulent behavior right. like squatting, um, especially mm -hmm. with uh, there was an illegal immigrant squatter um, that promoted squatting as a way to take your home. So that's one of the things that the register can work with state representatives, um, like future state rep Damien. Senator. Uh, Senator. <laughs> Senator. Senator. Don't, don't, Sorry, don't, future don't, Senator Damien Incatel, uh, in order to uh, in order to create uh, legislation or to create um, or to uh, educate citizens about uh, your rights as homeowners to prevent squatters. Uh, especially in illegal uh, uh, sanctuary jurisdictions. Um, and I have, you know, fought against illegal sanctuary jurisdictions in my, in my career. Um, well, um, I hope you continue that because that is something mm -hmm. that's very important to our residents mm -hmm. and our landlords are getting affected mm -hmm. every day. Yep. And the courts do not provide any relief because they're all socialists. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Ben, if you can just throw up both Mr. Ring and Mr. Ankatel's, uh, there you go. Mr. Ring is yep. uh, running for the Register of Deeds in the Southern Essex, Essex District. Southern Essex District. And please and go to jonathanring.org. That's jonathanring.org to learn more. Okay, and now we have Mr. Ankatel. Yeah. So I'd appreciate if you uh, consider voting for me. I will fight for your uh, your public safety. I'll make sure that our communities and our schools are are not overwhelmed with illegal immigrants. I'll help uh, uh, save some money on the spending on them. 
I will make sure that we have a, a safe community for our kids in our schools. Cut I'm the a, budget. I'm a, and I'll cut the budget. <laughs> I'm a, good night, Dave. Have a good one. Thank Bye. you very much. <laughs> Zero. Ooh. That went all right. Just, just you relax. Are you good?